as a Native American individual, you have the sovereignty to decide who you are. That is your right. That is your individual choice. And so these beliefs and these concepts that somebody has placed on you that you are this or you are that, we do not have to take that upon ourselves and become that. There was this expectation of who we were supposed to be and that we couldn't rise above that because we were native or as a lot of people called us Indian. Debunking this myth is really important to our team because it's our goal to debunk myths that perpetuate stigma, you know, with the hope that we can help people and communities who are seeking healing. In my experience, this myth prevents a lot of healing, so it's high time to debunk it. Welcome to episode 10 of Debunked, the only Utah podcast combining evidence-based health practices with storytelling to challenge the stereotypes and debunk the myths about harm reduction, opioids, and substance use disorders. I'm Tim Light, and today we will be discussing the myth that all Native Americans do is drink, gamble, and take money from the government. Man, I can hardly say that myth out loud. In this conversation, we'll cover the dangers of stereotypes, specifically in terms of substance use disorders and more broadly, of course. We'll also talk about where this idea that Native Americans are lazy and only take advantage of the government comes from. We'll discuss how Native Americans are portrayed on TV and in media, or traditionally have been portrayed. And we'll also talk about why it's important to debunk this myth. Before we jump into this conversation, let's first have our guests introduce themselves. So we'll start with Michelle and then go to Ashanti and then Irene. Hello, my name is Michelle Chapoose. I am a licensed substance use disorder counselor. I work with um, USU currently on a tribal and rural opioid reduction grant. And so I'm working with the tribal communities within our state to deliver naloxone and um, naloxone trainings and information about opioids. And also of course, to give some insight into addiction and where individuals in our tribal communities and rural communities can find help. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ashanti. I am the outreach director for Warrior Spirit, a native owned and ran facility in Tuolumne, Utah. I am active in YPR, which is Young People in Recovery, and I am just happy to be here. I'm Irene Ota. I am retired from the University of Utah after teaching diversity and social justice courses for over 20 years. Now I am. Um, have my own consulting training business. Great, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us, Irene. Uh, we're really excited to have you on the episode. So again, the myth that we are debunking today is that all Native Americans do is drink, gamble, and take money from the government. Many non-Indigenous people believe that tribes receive benefits or, you know, quote, free money that other ethnic groups aren't entitled to. It's important to point out as you know, we move forward in this episode that any service that a tribe receives from the federal government was negotiated in land treaties. So tribes negotiated for things like healthcare, education, and sovereignty as part of being essentially forced to give their land to the government. Many tribes run businesses to make dividends that are then spent according to their local tribal law. And tribal businesses include, but are not limited to, bison farming, agriculture, casinos, oil mining, and so many other businesses. The funding generated by these businesses is spent as tribal leadership sees fit in their own communities. So it's not a government handout. In terms of substance use, rates of alcohol use disorder, for example, do trend a bit higher in some indigenous communities. Um, but given, you know, generational trauma that's been passed through communities over the decades, as well as high rates of poverty and lack of infrastructure and common utilities, this is perhaps unsurprising. But I think it's important to point out and remind the listeners of what Dr. Erin Fanning Madden talked about in episode six of Debunked. Uh, she pointed out that it matters immensely where we are looking and how we are measuring differences between rates of, of substance use disorders and whatnot when talking about any group of people, but specifically about Native Americans. So if you look at Utah, rates of opioid overdose deaths between non-Hispanic whites 
and Native Americans are about the same. If we say in the past year, have you drank alcohol? Non-Hispanic whites in Utah are more likely to answer yes. So therefore, Native Americans are more likely to have abstained in the last year from alcohol than non-Hispanic whites. If we say, have you ever drank alcohol? Native Americans are more likely than non-Hispanic whites to never have drank alcohol. So as we've discussed in previous episodes, all groups of people, regardless of ethnic heritage, have historically used substances for many reasons, you know, including to address trauma and pain. The important thing is to remember that no ethnic group, no racial group, is more biologically predisposed to substance use disorder than another. Addiction is heavily dependent on sociologic, political, and cultural contexts. Okay, so I want to hear one or two sentences from each of you about, you know, what you think when you hear this myth. So Ashanti, do you want to start? And then we could go to Irene. It breaks my heart to hear this because this is, this is a myth, right? Like I grew up spending um, half my time on my reservation, half my time in the city. And so I know that in the community and the experience that I had growing up, that a lot of, you know, people kind of were like, the first thing they asked me, oh, you're native, do you get money? Like, and where does that come from, right? And and they usually think that it's from the government. And I'm just like, wait, why, why would you think that the government gives me money because I'm native? Uh, well, because of those casinos, right? Well, well, then the money would come from the casino, right? Like, <laughs> it breaks my heart to to know that there's like this really big lack of understanding in our community of where where our funds come from, how we've gained those, and and what we do with it as as people, you know, on and off our reservation. Thanks, Ashanti. So, Irene, what do you think when you hear this myth? The first thing I think of is that people don't know their history. People don't know the history of, of how the United States ha has treated, and the colonizers have treated uh, Native Americans, Indigenous peoples on the American continent. They, they just don't understand the history. They don't understand what has transpired expired up until now. They don't understand that not all Native American communities have casinos. In fact, very few have casinos. And that this money, again, as the money that comes from the government is, is actually not enough. And, and in fact, our government has diverted money that rightfully should go to native communities and, and native countries and governments. And when government gives money to Native Americans, it's not altruistic at all. It's called forced dependence. So when you force a community to become dependent upon this source of money, then you can control them. You can make rules. You can force compliance and obedience. And so and when I hear it, I get angry and I think, we need to talk about the history here. Yeah, thank you. Michelle, what do you think when you hear this myth? You know, you can see how it transcends not just the financial situations that our tribal communities have. It, it makes me think about our, the myth that we debunked a couple episodes ago about, you know, the predisposition that Native American populations have to, to addiction. Those, it's like, and they all just kind of piggyback off of each other. You know, it's like you have this belief that this is going on, that you're getting money from the government, free money from the government for whatever reason. And because of that, you have no work ethic. And because you have no work ethic, you're lazy. And because you're lazy, you're just going to take that money and you're going to use it on drugs and alcohol. That's just going to make your communities poor. You know, stuff like it just, they these beliefs and these concepts just jump off of each other. We see advertisements, we see movies, we hear about casinos, you know, we see all of that. And not just us seeing it, but society as a whole sees it, which in my opinion, begins to make this um, social belief, uh, you know, stronger. It's like, yeah, oh yeah, my parents told me that that you all Native American people or all Indians get money from the government. 
So I don't know how many conversations I've actually had with people, friends of mine that are non-native. Um, you know, in reality, I'm of dual heritage. So I'm part, um, you know, I'm part Native American, I'm part you, but I'm also part um, white, Caucasian. And so even on my mother's side of the family, these are conversations that actually occur. Yeah, and it's, it is really hard to correct somebody. Yeah. I mean, I had a couple experiences, gosh, in the last three months where I was, I heard this myth just so I'm Caucasian. I was speaking to another Caucasian and this person told me, you know, um, they categorized an entire nation of Native Americans, not going to mention who, but they categorized an entire nation of Native Americans and um, said that they were lazy and that they, all they did was drink and that they didn't care about their kids. And what was their evidence base? Well, that's what my, my mom said, because my mom grew up on that nation. And I was like, I just had this moment of like, it was almost like outer, you know, outer body where I was, I could just see the situation and how it is transcending generations. And it's, it's, it's just like deeply rooted and it's time for us to have these conversations. It's time to debunk this myth, right? Yeah. Irene, what do you think? How do you correct someone in that space? What's a, a good way for us to go about doing that? Well, um, I am a certified a uh, trainer of anti-discrimination response, which I highly recommend to people. One of the um, principles of anti-discrimination response is that we are not trying to change other people's minds. You know, if, if anyone can do that, they're my new best friend because I got lots of people I want you to change their mind, okay? What we can do is stand up for what we believe in. And it can be just as simple as, I don't believe that's true or I know research that proves that to be wrong, or I find that comment to be a stereotype. I find that comment to be racist. I don't believe it, that offends me. And you see that these are I statements and that we don't, um, we don't say, you just made a racist statement. We say, I find that statement to be racist. Um, and you make that statement and sometimes you just have to walk away. Because some people wanna argue so as much as I know I'm not going to change your mind, guess what? You're not going to change mine either. <laughs> so. Your words caused me to reflect on perhaps times that I have perpetuated stereotypes. Maybe there are times, but maybe not directly, maybe more so by inaction and choosing not to, to make those hard statements. When somebody else makes a really offensive, racist, uh, discriminative statement, um, you know, there are times when I haven't spoken up, which is perpetuating that stereotype. It's letting them know that's okay, or that it's stronger than my beliefs, and that's just not true. To be silent is taken as either agreement or not caring or fear. And I can tell you at this stage of my life, I don't want anybody to think I agree with any kind of racist, oppressive statement that I don't care about when racism or oppression happens. Or, and, and you know, sometimes I am afraid. You have to be careful of your environment. And anti-discrimination response speaks to that when there's fear of your safety. Um, but that's rarely been true in my situation, right? That I'm afraid someone's gonna beat me up or pull out a gun or anything like that. But um, sometimes it is scary. It, it is scary to try to speak up. Yeah, it is. It's complicated, but... Um, I'm excited to continue this conversation because already it has been so enlightening. Um, we need to take a quick break, but after the break, we'll talk about the dangers of stereotypes and you know where this idea that Native Americans are lazy and only take advantage of the government came from. Um, we also will talk a bit about the how media portrays Native Americans and how it has done so in the past, which has contributed to this myth. So we'll be right back. The Debunked Podcast is made possible by our members and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Rural Opioid Technical Assistance Program, offering programs to address barriers of access to rural communities related to opioid use disorder. And Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Utah works to transform health care from the inside out. We reduce confusion, waste, and red tape for members as we help them navigate the health care system. The information on the show is so important, so relevant, and definitely information that more people need to hear. So please take a minute to rate and review the show. 
There's something about the algorithm. The more reviews, the more debunked shows up in people's feeds. So rate and review. Thanks. Welcome back to Debunked. The myth that we are debunking today is that all Native Americans do is drink, gamble, and take money from the government. Right now we're going to talk about the dangers of stereotypes, where this idea that Native Americans are lazy and only take advantage of government came from, and how media portrayals of Native Americans contribute to this myth. So Irene, why are stereotypes dangerous? Because they justify marginalization, oppression, and um, violence against those that we stereotype against. If they're lazy, then they deserve to be poor. If they're lazy, then they deserve not to get treatment. If they're lazy, then we don't have to worry about them. If they're lazy, we can treat them badly. So um, it, it, it's just an excuse. It's justification for violence of any type. I'm talking about emotional, psychological, and physical violence against them. Gosh, and it, you, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it also feels like um, a stereotype kind of dehumanizes somebody and, or it can dehumanize people and create this outgroup, which then of course perpetuates all the things that you just said. There's one thing that's been bothering me, it's been on the news. It's, you know, the Continental Railroad and how we're celebrating um, the Golden Spike and all that stuff. Just mm -hmm. recently, they had this three ton beautiful sculpture of a bison, a buffalo placed in front of it to honor it. And I'm thinking, wait, it was the railroad that disseminated the bison, the buffalo, and further marginalized and oppressed the Native Americans. Why are we doing this? Again, we are skewing history. We're rewriting it. I got so angry. I'm yelling at the TV. I don't teach anymore, so I can't yell in my classroom. But you can see, right, that these stereotypes of, uh, and this mis revision of, of history and, and how we use things. And, and the buffalo was very important to Native Americans. They had a Native American who talked about how important the buffalo, the bison were to Native Americans. But nothing was mentioned about how the railroad actually almost drove it to extinction. And I, boy, let's talk about rewriting history. Yeah. Wow. So Ashanti, what kind of effect did hearing these stereotypes have on you or others you know, either when you were a kid or even now? Um, when I was a kid and I would just kind of like, I had this, I still have it. It's in my nature. It's part of who I am. And I'm just kind of like this free spirited person and just soul. And so I would go from like one, I don't know, reality to the next. I would constantly be shifting between these two worlds of like my native community and where I you know, grew up. And I would leave one world where everything felt really free and really good. And that was like, when we were in Makar, when I was in Alaska with my family, and then I'd go back and it would be like this constant, almost bullying, right? Like I would see, you would see cartoons of Native Americans like drinking. So my my parents were alcoholics, which was hard. It really shaped who I am today. And I would, I would like call my mom at, at different bars, right? Like, and that's how I would like have to get a hold of her. And one thing that I noticed is that it was just like, she was almost expected to be like, that's kind of like how she was raised. She was raised without, you know, being placed up on a pedestal and being like, you're this amazing, most treasured, wonderful human being, which is the actual truth. She's my mom and she really is those things. And, and instead of having that, like she had a lot of moments and I could feel it and see it. And I, I lived it with her. So we had a lot of moments where it was just like, expected to be an alcoholic, expected to be in bars, expected to spend that, there goes my quotation marks, free money in bars and separated from your children, which, you know, alcoholism has a way of doing that, but that alcoholism has a way of doing that in every single 
race. Like it does not matter. It's not, it's, you know, it's not a prejudice disease. It, it affects everyone and it doesn't discriminate. It does not discriminate, not discriminate. Right. So, and it's just like, and it, a lot of the effects are the same. There's separation. There's a world that only revolves around that person, the lack of connection. Right. And then the shame and the guilt and the constant. So, so for me, it was like the shift, like everything was okay to like, there was this expectation of who we were supposed to be and that we couldn't rise above that because we were native or as a lot of people called us Indian. I remember I said that one time and my mom was like, you are native young lady, like you are native American. And I was just like, oh, okay. I stopped knowing what the difference was. Right. Like I stopped knowing that because that was just, you know, this demand of I was going to grow up and be an alcoholic. I was not going to be in my children's lives. If I was, it was going to be hard, you know, and and that generational kind of thing that comes down from the separation at boarding schools where there was like lack of love and connection and emotional eye contact and body language of like kissing you on the forehead at night and holding you close and looking your parent in the eye and having them say I love you and hug you you know because none of that was allowed no cultural was allowed you know if I if I wore braids in my hair people called me like an Indian at school I was just like what okay you know like that's who I am then you know or people would say like you should dress up as Pocahontas I got that a lot or they came dressed up as Pocahontas and I was just like what what is going on you know it was it was it was difficult it was it was difficult kind of a transition between I guess two worlds it was really hard to identify in both right oh, that's just so heartbreaking I'm I'm really sorry that you experienced that and that so many, so many experience. Ashanti's, Ashanti, of course, your experience is unique to your journey, but it's oh, it's all too common, right? Michelle, do you have thoughts on this? Well, I really like how Ashanti talked about, um, you know, that you're expected to be what you, what society believes you to be. You, you know, lazy. You get money from the government. You're an alcoholic. You're a drug addict. And, you know, even like within the education system, you see in some schools where there's a high population of Native American students, they're not expected to succeed. And so when somebody does start to break those expectations or break those um, norms that people, the, the box that somebody has put our Native American children in and our, you know, our youth, our teenagers or our adults, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you're, you're a special type of Native. You're not like everybody else <laughs> instead of just seeing that you're an individual who has as much potential for success as any other person who is walking this earth and so when we see these stereotypes I know like from my own personal experiences it's like you hear it all the time like with how Ashante talked about like within schools it's like yeah you're native you're Indian and you're not going to succeed. And so there was a part of me at a younger age, and I know, you know, I've had the opportunity to work within the education system with our, with our Native American youth. And there's this hard belief that it's like, you know, you hear something enough, it's like, well, maybe I am, maybe that's who I am. Yeah, I'm not going to take this test because I know I'm not going to be successful because somebody told me that I'm just a dumb Indian. You know, I remember sitting in a math class once, it was an advanced math class. And the teacher would put uh, a problem, an algebra problem on the board. I think it was, it was like in seventh grade. And um, I would go in and I'd solve it. But then I would look around and none of the other kids, you know, none of the other smart white kids weren't, you know, they weren't done. So I automatically assumed that I was wrong. And so I didn't, I would sit back and be like, okay, I know because I'm dumb, because I'm a dumb Indian. And then, you know, and when I got into my high school years, it's like, you hear it enough. It's like, yeah, all Native American people do or all Indians do is drink. So yeah, it gave me the doorway and the justification to be able to say, yeah, you know, I'm just, that's just what I do. This is who I am. You know, I dropped out of high school my senior year and it's like, yeah, because that's what I do. That's who I am. You know, drinking, doing my, doing what I did. 
yeah, that's who I am. And so I think when we talked about in the last episode, a couple episodes back about the um, genetic dis disposition, those uh, beliefs that were um, placed upon me, those, those ideas, those concepts of my identity that were placed upon me that I listened to, I began to believe. And so those beliefs, the beliefs of the oppressor then became my beliefs. And then my beliefs I shared with like my friends. Yeah, we're all this. And so you can kind of see how it's just like it waves out. It can be so challenging to bust through this frame, this box that you've been placed in. You know, and it, it comes down to understanding who you are as an individual. But then, you know, we talked about boarding schools. My father, my dad was in a boarding school and he used to tell the stories of when he was seven or eight years old running away. The boarding school he went to was 18 miles from my home, seven or eight, him and his little friends, young guys would run away and follow the river down to get home. And, you know, and that's not a day trip. <laughs> so it's like, even though, you know, with that, the, the things that my father dealt with, those things were passed down, those coping skills were passed down. These, you know, so you can see how these are so ingrained and how they are very impactful, but it takes understanding and it takes an understanding of self and an understanding of your emotions. And that's the part that's always difficult when we start talking about racist type concepts or marginalization. You can become very emotional because it is an attack on your core. And so to talk to somebody when somebody is making those comments without having that emotional discharge where it becomes confrontational, where it becomes, you know, that emotional part of you, because then you're vulnerable, then you begin to believe, you know, depending on where those coping mechanisms are coming from, it, it, it's, very, it's extremely challenging. I just want to invite the listener to count how many times they hear these kind of stereotypes perpetuated. Just take a month and count how many times in normal conversation, quote, normal conversation, you hear a stereotype, such as natives are lazy and gamble and all they do is drink. I think you'll be surprised. Michelle and Ashanti, when you both were speaking, I couldn't help but think about um, cartoons and like Disney movies. I kept seeing over and over again in my mind, Peter Pan and the native that's running around smoking and he's like all green, you know? And I kept thinking about Pocahontas, that, that song where it's savages, savages, barely even human. Do you, either of you have thoughts on, you know, how that makes Native Americans feel when, when you or others you know have watched these movies or these cartoons? Like what, what was that like, that experience? I remember watching those. So I have a, my daughter, she's 27, but my daughter is a quarter Ute and she's as blonde and blue eyed as they come and very fair skin, even though she can, you know, even though her grandfather, my dad was full Ute. And so when she was little and these movies came out, I remember her um, looking at me and just, it was just a look of almost like, is that real? <laughs> and so, you know, it, and before all of this, before I had the opportunity to um, learn how to manage the, you know, understand what this is about on an, on a different level and know how to manage my emotion when something like this comes up, I didn't know what to say. I was just like, you know, kind of flabbergasted. It's like, I, I really don't know what to tell you. Just that that's not true. You know, that's, that's not what we look like. That's not how people dress. All Native American people do not have this big square nose. You know, not all Native American people wear headdresses. Not all Native American people smoke pipe. You know, and it's so interesting, even like with the pipe concept. So I have a sister-in-law who's Sue and pipe ceremony is very, very sacred. But yet in the, our uh, media and in our cartoons, it's viewed as, you know, smoke them peace pipe type thing. And so something as sacred and even the sacred as a headdress and the, the way a headdress is used is totally, you know, minimized and made to be like, yeah, you know, insignificant. It's disrespectful. Like the, yeah. Very disrespectful, but yeah. because there's no 
understanding as to what that really is all about, because there is no understanding on how that is played, the role that that plays in somebody's culture and in their beliefs and spiritual practices. So when we see that before my, before I fully understood, I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know how to answer those questions because I myself, you know, like I said, being of dual heritage, I saw it from my mother's family. And if you yourself don't fully understand and then begin to believe these concepts and these beliefs that you, that are being portrayed, there's a part of you that just makes you feel so vulnerable, but it's like how, if you don't understand and know how to respond to that, you just kind of like, Hmm. You know, so, I mean, that was my own personal experience, but now it's like somebody, so I had an opportunity to take Irene's course when she was, when I was a student. And it's like, now when things like that pop up, I'm going to engage in that conversation. And there's times when I know there, when I need to walk away from that conversation. But, you know, even for our, for our tribal members or just for our Native American individuals, to understand that, to understand what this is, is going to help better prepare yourself for the comments that are there, the depictions that are there. Yeah. Ashanti, do you have thoughts on this? Growing up, people used to ask me about like my costume. Do you have a costume? Do you wear a costume? And I would look at them and I I knew what they meant, right? Like I kind of knew where they were going with that. And I'd be like, it's regalia. I have ceremonial regalia and I dance at powwows. And they would be like, oh, okay, well, can you dance for me? What does that look like? Or, you know, do you have feathers or do you have this or do you have that and I'm coastal native so I'm Clinket from Alaska and Macaw from Washington and Shushwap from Canada and our traditional regalia looks a lot different you know and it will look different across wherever you go it's different and so ours was like button blankets and you know we have black and red and whales and log cabins and cedar cabins and I'd be like, you know, natives aren't people that just lived in teepees that dragged them everywhere. And I think even when I was really young, and I I think I'm outspoken because I came from an outspoken woman who has a lot of strength. And even as a kid, I would be like, it is not a costume. We do not live in teepees, you know, like, and when you see it just so derogatory and just blatantly disrespectful put in for humor for children and like that savages songs it just perpetuates this like you are allowed to be racist like you are allowed to say derogatory things you are allowed to be single-minded when you think of this race of people and disney's gonna go along with it so if disney supports it then every family who buys Disney supports it. And unfortunately, I buy Disney. So I find myself in support. But, you know, even I don't think I've ever let my youngest daughter watch Pocahontas, which is kind of funny. Just and I and I've gotten to that as I've grown with myself and I've become more comfortable in who I am and what my standards are and and what I will allow in for her to see because it's really important how she identifies and how she identifies as being Native American and what that means. And I and I love being able to try and teach her like, you are macaw, you are clinket, and sh- and she'll look at me and and her face is cute, you know. And so it's really important that those cartoon characters that we don't support them because we don't want our young kids to be subjected to those things and be like, oh, okay, that's who they are. This is what they do. I believe in being seen differently. I believe that change is possible because I've done a lot of self change. So I really believe that change is possible. Thank you, Ashanti. So Irene, speaking of you know these concepts, let's talk a little bit about you know when people say reverse racism. And then Michelle, maybe you could comment on how that concept maybe justifies some of these media portrayals. 
So the important issue here is, or the point here is that you have to have power to build and perpetuate and reinforce an institution of racism, okay? People of color do not have that power. They don't make the laws. They can't break the laws without consequence. They can't change the laws. People with power, and this is how I define power, people with power are the ones who can make the laws, change the laws whenever they want to, and break them without consequence. And they are the ones who build this institution of racism that denies certain populations based on race, any access or limited access to opportunities, resources, and rewards. So therefore, there cannot be reverse racism because people of color don't have that power. People of color don't have the power. So when um, the, the Civil Rights Voting Act was dismantled, right, by our Supreme Court, and because it was thought that now people of color can vote equally, have free access. Well, what happened? New laws were made, right? Voter ID laws, purging of, of voter records, et cetera. Who had the power to do that, right? And whose names were purged? And what communities were um, where voting places, polls were moved, or there were only one or two? There's two schools of thought on being racist. There are scholars who say that only white people could be racist because they are dominant and they have power and that everyone else can be a bigot. I don't, for me, I don't understand the difference being a bigot, being a racist. I think my parents who are Japanese, we immigrated from Japan. I was born in Japan and came over. My parents didn't speak English. They were immigrants, right? Japanese immigrants. Uh, my parents were extremely racist against African-Americans and Mexicans. They said the most horrifying things about them, the stereotypes, the denigration. It was awful. And, and I, I think my parents were racist because they were, they were harboring this information without evidence based on stereotypes and what they heard. Now, they're racist and they are reinforcing and perpetuating the institution of racism that the dominant society had created. Okay. They could not build an institution of racism. They have no power. They didn't even speak English, right? But they reinforced and perpetuated that institution of racism that had influenced them into how they regarded African-Americans and Mexicans. I just want, again, to invite the listener to really I take a moment to think about these deep issues uh, in an introspective way. Um, because I can, I can imagine that there might be some who feel this sense of defensiveness coming up when we talk about these issues. And I think that's a good sign that it's a good time to sit down and really think about these things from an objective perspective. So Michelle, can you talk to us a bit about, you know, how potentially these concepts that Irene just highlighted about, you know, racism and people claiming that there's reverse racism and things, how potentially these could um, justify the portrayal and the stereotypes of Native Americans and others in popular media. It's easy for somebody to say, oh, it's not me, it's you. You know, it's not this, it's not the way society has been set up that makes me feel that I'm better than you or more educated than you or have a PhD and you don't. It's in, and I think that's a lot of what we're dealing with is it's become so socially accepted. It's become such a social norm that it's okay to say the word, oh, you're being savage. But do you understand what savage really means? It means you have no, you are not human. You have no God. You have no social structure. You have no, it's like, you might as well be running around naked, ro rolling around in the dirt. It is just like, you are savage. And a lot of our young people will say that. And, you know, it, but it perpetuates a concept and a belief that was placed on indigenous peoples throughout the world to justify 
the colonization and the, the marginalization and the, in a sense, conquering of them. You know, we talk about the Disney movie, um, Pocahontas, and the, sav- the song Savages. Interestingly enough, how many of our young people actually know that song? Yeah. And can just sing it, not really understanding what the word savage means and where it was based. And then we perpetuate those concepts sometimes, you know, indirectly. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. That was beautiful. So Irene, can you give us a bit of a historical background of why, you know, this myth came about and, you know, maybe talk a bit about like the sociological and historical context that drove this myth to existence? It was about getting land. And there were two two ideologies that perpetuated for the um, European colonizers. One was manifest destiny, and that goes along with the savage, not being Christian, not being, God, you know, believing in a God, where manifest destiny um, said that, well, God wants you to have this land. It's your destiny. And so what higher authority is there for for Christian Europeans than God, right? The other is the doctrine of discovery that they created to justify, which was, hey, if you see it and it's not being used properly and in whose eyes it's properly used, right? It's yours. Just plant your flag. It's what we do all the time. We plant our flag wherever we go to say, we've discovered it, right? We didn't discover it. And again, it all goes back to depicting them as savages, as non-humans. When we say that we honor sovereignty, which didn't come until much, much later, sovereignty, our understanding of of Native American sovereignty is the right to self-govern with ownership to land. We rarely honor that. Even with the casinos, the United States government has their fingers in it. So where's the sovereignty? Right. Again, it reminds me of the episode we recorded um, before with Ashanti and Michelle, um, because it just reminded me of the political moves that were made. Like the, the slogan for boarding schools was kill the Indian to save the man. I mean, is that not just horrifying? It's just, and it's clearly a systematic approach to, you know, establishing that power for the dominant group. You know, and I was thinking when we're talking about what the whole purpose of our, um, of this episode of debunked is, you know, you know, cause we're debunking beliefs that re- are in regard to opioid uses, right? Addiction, substance use, you know, and we look at the concept of sovereignty, a sovereignty, you know, it made me think it was, as I was thinking, it's like, you know, as a native American individual, you have the sovereignty to decide that who you are. It's like, that is your right. That is your individual choice. And so these, these beliefs and these concepts that somebody has placed on you that you are this or you are that, we do not have to take that upon ourselves and become that. As an individual and as a Native American individual, you become so broken that you feel that this is what you are. This is what your destiny is. But the reality is, is with these beliefs, these, these um, different concepts is, and what this whole purpose is, is to break that down that no, you are not defined by what somebody else says you are, you make who you are. And your success is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tougher road. I'm not saying that it doesn't have greater challenges because of this marginalization, because of this institution of racism, there are greater challenges, but how amazing and how powerful Native American populations are to rise above that. Yeah, that was beautiful, Michelle. So well said. Okay, we have to take a quick break, but after the break, we'll talk about why it's important to debunk this myth in our communities, and we'll specifically talk about why it's important in terms of harm reduction, because like Michelle said, the purpose of this podcast is to talk about harm reduction. So we'll be right back. The Debunked Podcast is made possible by our members and USU's Department of Kinesiology and Health Sciences, committed to educating and serving students and members of both local and extended communities in the fields of kinesiology and health science. Information at khs.usu.edu. 
and the Tribal and Rural Opioid Initiative of Utah State University, an effort to address opioid use among rural Utahns in the hopes of eliminating myths and promoting health. Information at khs.usu.edu.outreach. Welcome back to Debunked. The myth that we are debunking today is all Native Americans do is drink, gamble, and take money from the government. So now let's jump into talking about why it's important to debunk this myth, specifically um, in terms of harm reduction. So Ashanti, in terms of harm reduction, why is it important that we debunk this myth and that we stop stereotypes like savage and other, you know, other stereotypes? Um, I think it's so important that we bring some harm reduction in. And right now it's so beautiful because it, it always looks like different things, right? Harm reduction looks like creating space for people to be accepted and loved. Harm reduction looks like being able to use medication while being in treatment for addiction. Harm reduction looks like a safe place to exchange a needle and to not perpetuate diseases, right? Harm reduction looks like people that are standing together at our capital and fighting for more medication you know, more, more resources for people, right? Harm reduction right now looks like opening up and having an understanding that all Native Americans are not Indians and not all Indians do this, this, or that, right? Harm reduction looks like standing up and having a voice for young kids, right, who didn't get to have that voice or didn't have an adult who was safe and loving and had that shared with them because that's not what was shared with them, which wasn't shared with them for generations, right? So harm reduction looks like going into our community and saying, I don't agree with what you just said. I do not feel comfortable with what you just said. If I, I'm really learning and growing every day, I really try and do my best. But if I hear somebody say something and it's derogatory or it's racist, usually my first reaction is like this really stern eyebrow, like really deep creased eyebrow stare. And it probably is kind of like intimidating. I'm like, did you just say that? And I'll just say it like out loud in our conversation. And then realize that that conversation is actually with a group of other people. And <laughs> those people are all now looking at me, right? And I'm like, well, that's okay. You can look at me because I'm not going to be the one that sits and just doesn't say anything. And that's what this harm reduction looks like. We are not sitting around and not saying anything. We are out of love, out of understanding, out of wanting a change for our future, going to say something and stand up for this. Thank you so much. I'm going to read um, from um, a book that I have. And this is the voice of Donna Chavez, who is Lundy. And she says, once people, and that's all of us, get out and find the realities of our existence and see that it is there, they are amazed. They will be amazed at the durability, survivability, and sustainability of people, Native people, who've been able to continue after so many hundreds of years and after so many attempts at devastation. So I hope that's what debunking the myth will do. Well, help us see the realities and help us know that Native Americans are a people who are durable. They survive, they sustain, and they had to do so through a continuous time of genocide and devastation. That was beautiful, thank you. Michelle, what do you think the world would look like without these stereotypes? I honestly do not feel that I could put in words that would, you know, what Irene and Ashante said, that that sums it up right there. That's beautifully stated. So, you know, uh, like with Ashante, the freedom of expression without fear of judgment. And then, you know, Irene with the resiliency, it's, it's, it would be a beautiful thing. And I think, yeah, that, I mean, I really can't even express in, um, I don't think in an effective manner, 
what that, I think it would be more of a, I think for anybody listening to this, it would probably be, you could all feel kind of, you know, have a, a slight feeling of what that would feel like, that freedom. Michelle, as a substance use disorder counselor, um, why is it important for you to debunk this myth for people that you're helping professionally? So when we're dealing with substance use issues, the belief is it's not just the substance. The substance is the distraction. What's underneath that is the hurt. Why did somebody feel that they needed to find a distraction? Usually, um, you know, if somebody is looking for a distraction, it's because there's a very, there's an emotion, you know, there's depression, there's anxiety, there's trauma that they don't know how to cope and manage. And when that um, is triggered and presents itself into a situation and somebody doesn't have the skills or abilities to manage that, then they'd seek for a distraction. And then of course, once we seek for a distraction, you know, substances do what they do and they, they're designed to do what they do and they do it perfectly without any care as to who you are. Your socioeconomics, they don't care where you came from or who you are. They do what they do. And if you distract enough with a substance, it's going to hijack the way the brain processes. And so if somebody, if an individual is dealing with these challenges about their own self-concepts um, that come along with stereotyping, that can, it doesn't come, it doesn't happen for everyone. That's, I think that's one of the biggest things, but harm, you know, but it, it can have severe and very deep effects for, for a majority of people. You know, there are specific behaviors, there are specific mannerisms and justification is one of those things. And if you're in a place where you are just feeling unvalued and just hurt and wounded, sometimes that justification is the perfect tool that you need to keep you going in that direction. And the challenge is always to come to, to, to get yourself into a different realm of thinking. When we look at these harm reduction concepts, you know, breaking this myth, how does that reduce the harm of somebody who is dealing with a substance use disorder? Well, it helps remind them that they are an individual and that they have control, that they have power, that they are valuable, that these beliefs and these, um, these oppositions that they may be facing, that they have the power and the ability to overcome those. And it may be step by step, you know, with, when we look at harm reduction, it's like on a spectrum, right? Breaking this stigma, it may not necessarily be for those who are not the person saying this to the group of individuals, but it's more for the person who is hearing it and breaking those beliefs that have been placed on them as an individual. The Debunk Podcast is made possible by our members and the Emma Eccles Jones College of Education and Human Services. Committed to quality teaching, outreach, and research. Offering services to the community and providing students with real-world service and research opportunities. Information at cehs.usu.edu. Thanks for joining us today on Debunked, the only Utah podcast combining evidence-based health practices with storytelling to challenge the stereotypes and debunk the myths about harm reduction, opioids, and substance use disorders. I'm Tim White, and today we debunk the myth that all Native Americans do is drink, gamble, and take money from the government. Join us for episode 11 on November 11th, where we will be debunking the myth that harm reduction practices increase crime and drug use in my community. Today, we talked about the dangers of stereotypes. We talked about where this idea that Native Americans are lazy and only take advantage of the government came from. We discussed how Native Americans are portrayed on TV and media and how these portrayals actually perpetuate this myth and these stereotypes. And we also talked about why it's important to debunk this myth in our communities, specifically why it's important to debunk these myths in our communities in terms of harm reduction. You can find links to the resources mentioned in this episode on our social media platform at debunk pod and speaking of social media check us out on instagram twitter facebook and youtube at debunked pod or on our website at bit.ly forward slash debunked pod don't forget to tell all your friends about debunked and remind them that they can find the show on the podcast app spotify upr.org and anywhere else they get their podcasts 
Debunked is produced in collaboration with Utah Public Radio. Funding for the show comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the Office of Health Equity and Community Engagement, the Utah State University Department of Kinesiology and Health Sciences, and Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield. Our editorial board is Jay Hymas, Adam Baxter, Ashanti Moritz, Savannah Ely, Dr. Sandra Solzer, Dr. Suzanne Prevedel, Dr. Aaron Fanning Madden, Mindy Vincent, Patrick Reset, Michelle Chapus, Dr. Marin Voss, Dr. Amy Kahn, Trisha Glass, Lloyd Arrive, Hilary Deesh, Jennifer Petrus, and Susie Baker. Debunked is produced by Nick Porth, Shalane Smith-Needham, and Friend Weller, with Nick Porth serving as lead producer. Our creative specialist is Autumn Gibbs. Music for today's episode was created by Nick Porth. Our science advisor is Dr. Aaron Fanning Madden, and our program directors are Dr. Sandra Solzer and Dr. Suzanne Prevedel. I'm Tim Light, host and editorial board member.